Uh, welcome, everybody. My name's Tony Ald. I'm the current president of the Australian Network for Plant Conservation. And I'd just like to welcome you all to our 13th conference on plant conservation in Australia. Uh, it's really great to have a number of special guests today, um, and also for those of you in the room to be here in person. And we also welcome those who are online, and there's a number of people who can only attend online today. Um, this morning, uh, we're privileged to have a welcome to country from Auntie Edna Stewart, who were Adjury Elder. And I'd just like to start by inviting Auntie Edna up for the welcome to country. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, it's a bit uh, something that I'm, uh, I love, plants. I'd first like to say in language, Nananagu Garegu Bila Galangu Nananigiri Ninyagi, look after the land and the rivers, then the land and the rivers will look after you. I'm proud to be a Rajari. I am a Rajari elder. I welcome you. I respect you. As a Rajari elder, I would like to welcome you here today on behalf of my people the Rajari people, who are the traditional custodians of this land that we are standing on today. I want to pay my respects to my ancestors of the past and thank them for their courage and resilience which they passed on to us during their journey. They had great knowledge, knowing how to take care of the land and knowing the seasons. And with this knowledge, they passed on to me, so today I'm able to pass it on to you, what I know, because of my elders. I want to respectfully acknowledge the elders and Aboriginal people of today. From other lands from which they come, I welcome you. This country, sorry, this country is more than, I just gotta get back, than a place, it's about our identity. As First Nations people, we speak of our country like a person sustaining our lives in every aspect, spiritual and culturally. We need to show Yindamara respect for the land and the life it supports, the wildlife and the human life. Rajari people have cared for this part of country for hundreds of thousands of years. We learnt how to live in harmony with country and taking what we need for our own survival, but also giving back. We only ask everyone, I also ask everyone to better protect our country and our sacred sites that rest upon it. Gwambana, Rajari Gu, Nurumbengu, Yinani Gu, Rajari Main, Mugawadu. Nindu do ye namara do dagan, which means you're welcome to walk on this country. Respect and honour the land, respect and honour each other. Mandangu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Auntie. Uh, we have a number of um, official guests today who are going to give us um, short talks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite Councillor Ashley Edwards from Albury City Council. Thank you, Auntie Edna, for welcoming us all. On behalf of Albury City, I warmly welcome delegates to the 13 13th Australasian Plant Conservation Conference. As mentioned by Auntie Edna, today we meet upon Wiradjuri land, and I would like to pay my respects to Wiradjuri elders past, present and emerging. This always was and always will be Wiradjuri land. I extend a special welcome to those of you who are visiting Albury for the first time. Albury is a clean, green and vibrant regional city, one I'm very proud to live in. For thousands of years, people have gathered, shared, and celebrated at this special place in the foothills of the Alps and on the banks of the mighty Murray River. 
Events like these are a fantastic opportunity for people to come together to network, share knowledge, and discuss the latest innovations and research in their specialist fields. With the overall conference theme of Seeds to Recovery, presentations, workshops, and field trips will cover such topics as the recovery of native plants and vegetation after fire and native seed supply. In fact, the biennial Australasian Plant Conservation Conference is the premier event in Australia to discuss native plant conservation issues and brings together plant conservation scientists and practitioners from across Australia to discuss the latest findings and how best to approach the key threats to plant conservation in Australia. I'd like to share with you some of Albury City's efforts in native plant conservation. A recent focus of our Environment and Natural Areas team at Albury City has been working on a project which evaluates the success of previous revegetation sites to determine success rates and effectiveness of preparation and management techniques to better guide future revegetation projects. This will allow us to better adapt to the impacts of climate change. The revegetation plan created as part of the project developed modelling to prioritise future sites based on aspects such as connectivity, threatened species presence, as well as other factors. The Aubrey Botanic Gardens team works collaboratively with the Friends of Aubrey Botanic Gardens to increase the community's awareness regarding plant conservation, for example, the endangered crimson spider orchid. This will ensure the garden's extensive plant collection is maintained and enhanced for future generations. Recently, Aubrey hosted the 21st New South Wales and Victorian Combined Weeds Conference. Some of you may have been there. Showcasing the latest research and ideas for managing the establishment, impact and spread of weeds. Given that weeds pose a significant threat, uh, risk to plant conservation, it is essential that they are effectively managed in the natural environment. Aubrey City has also been a corporate member of the ANPC since 2005, which is another way that Council supports plant conservation in Australia. We're delighted to have you here in Aubrey uh, for what I'm sure will be a compelling four days. I strongly urge first-time visitors to Aubrey and those of you who are returning to take the time to explore our region during your stay. The Aubrey CBD is a great place to start with many restaurants ca and cafes showcasing our fresh local produce and wine, if you're so inclined. Just across from the Entertainment Centre is the Murray Art Museum Aubrey, or MAMA, the region's most significant art museum featuring local, national and international artists. If you prefer the outdoors, which I'm sure many of you might, uh, we're perfectly located on the iconic Murray River where you'll find spectacular walking trails, including the Yindamara Sculpture Walk, a stunning collection of sculptures by local Indigenous artists. If you'd like to know more about Aubrey in the region, I encourage you to drop into our information centre, which is opposite the Aubrey train station. Once again, I welcome you to Aubrey, and I sincerely hope you enjoy your time here. And on behalf of Aubrey City, I wish you all the best for this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Our next speaker is the um, New South Wales member for Albury uh, in the state government, uh, Justin Clancy. Thank you, Tony, and welcome. Uh, Tony and I were speaking just before and we were talking about how important it is to actually be back to face to face. And I know it's been a challenging period. I know that, uh, Tony, this is a, uh, not the first time that uh, looked to stage the conference and it's been a challenging period. So it's, it is wonderful to be able to look out across a room and to see people back engaging with one another. And I think uh, one of the themes uh, about the conference or about the uh, network is that ability to network in the first instance and to be able to do that face to face is important. Uh, to Artie, Edna uh, and Arts, uh, welcome to country and how much that is valued in that regard. I'd like to thank Art and I'd like to um, you know, draw upon the words that Artie Edna spoke of there about looking after the land and rivers and the land and rivers will look after you. And I acknowledge that we stand on Wiradjuri country. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, uh, Art Edna's words are, are, are quite powerful um, the late Aunt Nancy uh, would also then speak in terms of the Murray River and would speak of the Murray River not as a boundary or as a border 
but as a place of coming together, a meeting place, a place for sharing ideas, for sharing thoughts, uh, for sharing knowledge, sharing wisdom. And uh, again, in that sense, uh, for me, though, that is uh, something powerful and there is a parallel between uh, what is happening over the next few days in terms of the conference uh, and those words of the elders that have spoken to us. Uh, for me, there is also um, some really important parallels between uh, the work that uh, the network does, uh, that this conference is doing, and the parallels or touch points, uh, several touch points in terms of the Aubrey community. Uh, looking at the projects that the network is involved in, there are several that uh, piqued my interest. Uh, in particular, uh, the Riverina Sand, Sand Hill Woodland communities. Uh, for someone that, uh, that grew up in the Riverina, uh, that absolutely precious ecosystem of the Sand Hills, at the touch point, the importance that that has in terms of First Nations cultural significance as well. And for me, very much growing up uh, amongst the white cypress and uh, you know the preciousness of that ecosystem. So I thank you for the work that you do uh, in that particular project. Uh, again, uh, the work that is done um, in terms of preservation of orchids. And uh, for me, uh, and Susan would be the same, we have a number of conver conversations with, uh, with people in our local area. And I'm aware of one family that has actually got a private title up in Nail Can uh, Hill Reserve, um, and that has remained in, in private title for their sole purpose because they want to protect an orchid that is uh, that is placed on that uh, that little parcel of land up there. Uh, so again, these um, and the beautiful thing beautiful thing about these orchids is they, yeah, the, the, this little glimpse of something so beautiful and and often uh, fragile and 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 uh, in some situations uh, quite rare and and in the need of uh, work to preserve in that regard. And so for me, the third touch point that is really quite critical in the work that you do uh, is very much around the bushfire recovery. And in, in that sense, uh, that is a, a really important touch point uh, for this community uh, because it was this community or just to the east of us uh, around Green Valley and, and Duns Road uh, that was severely impacted by the bushfires of 2019-2020. And I just want to, just like uh, Councillor Ashley uh, did in terms of work talking about Albury City's involvement, I just want to touch there in terms of some of the work that the New South Wales government is doing in that regard. Uh, and I'm aware that there are uh, three threatened species projects uh, in the southwest area uh, that's uh, receiving support through the Saving Our Species program. And I just want to touch on those because they, they illustrate uh, the work against a, a, around government and the work that, that your organisation does in that regard. Uh, it's estimated firstly that the 2019-2020 bushfires directly impacted approximately half of the known population of vulnerable phantom wattle in the Wamagama National Park. Uh, my more recent home country borders not far from the uh, Wamagama National Park. Uh, the 2019-20 20 bushfires reduced the healthy population of that phantom wattle to approximately 2,000 plants. At 12 months after the fire, incidental observations made across some fire impacted plots has revealed that while many plants were initially destroyed by the fire, recruitment of new seedlings and regeneration of larger plants uh, is occurring. Uh, there has also been support for the Bago and Kelton's leek orchids and these are both critically endangered and found not too far from here again, um, under threat from the Duns Road fire, uh, again, which was in early 2020. Uh, only a month prior to the fire in 2020, in December 2019, bot botanists and threatened species experts with the New South Wales Government Saving Our Species Program and the Royal Botanic Gardens had begun hand pollinating these orchids to help increase the chance of being able to collect viable seeds. So that action in December actually proved to be uh, very much a life-saving measure as the seeds were collected and stored at the Australian Plant Bank. Uh, and because of this, uh, these two orchids, known from only one location in Australia, uh, are now a lot more secure. And this story is important. It tells us two things. Uh, one, that the ecological and environmental work we are doing does provide hope for the future of our species and secondly, that through 
best practice science, research and practical on-ground actions, we can make a positive difference. So again, please um, feel most welcome to be here in Albury, a community that has several touch points, important touch points with the work that you do, and a community that uh, very much recognises the importance of networking, sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, sharing experiences and wisdom, very much part of uh, the networking and the role that that plays uh, for your organisation at the Australian Network for Plant Conservation. Welcome to Albury. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, and thanks you for those reflections on recovery after the fire too. It's a, it's a key theme of, of this particular conference. Uh, now I'd ask, like to ask um, the federal member for Farah, Susan Lay, to the stage. Thank you very much. Tony, and um, welcome all. Can I firstly acknowledge Auntie Edna's welcome to country, pay my respects to elders past and present, and that we are on Wiradjuri land. And I often do reflect on the connection between Australia's First Nations people and our unique natural landscapes. And that's very pertinent to my role as Environment Minister. But I'm delighted as local member for Farah to be also welcoming you here today. My electorate, I'm very lucky, takes in much of the Murray and Murrumbidgee River catchments in New South Wales. It starts at Gingellic on the Upper Murray, just this side of Gingellic actually, and then goes all the way to the South Australian border, um, up uh, towards Pooncarry on the Lower Darling, back around Hay, ba uh, Bulagal, and then the Riverina, Griffith, Leeton, Narandra, and um, it is absolutely an amazing piece of Australia. It's terrific to be here. Can I um, congratulate you, Tony Old, as president, and Joe Lynch, who was so involved in putting everything together, and Martin Driver, local and passionate and very involved in the subject matter of this conference. It's not easy to bring people together, and I also want to acknowledge those in the hybrid format. You're missing out on Aubrey, but you'll be back soon, I'm sure. Um, so well done. Aubrey is, a, as Justin has explained, a terrific location for conferences and for meeting, and particularly when it comes to the environment and the preservation of it. And I often think when it comes to plants, how it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to forget about plants, but people don't always think about plants. When there are fires, they think about, well, they think about koalas, they think about our, our mammals, they see our brush-tailed rock wallabies, people who love birds, of course, worry about birds. I always worry about little woodland birds that I see much less of now than I ever used to. But people don't always think about plants, and yet it is plants and the ecological communities that support our ecosystems, our habitats, and all, all the animals. And then when you think of the connection over 230 years of European settlement, not very long in the historic time clock, has wrought incredible damage on Australia's natural environment. And we saw that Europeans viewed the landscape as something that had to be tamed and removed and um, fences and exotic grasses were introduced as well as hard-hooved animals. And you all know that much better than I do, but for having to have you as a network that's dedicated to plant conservation, do what you do, is extremely important in the light of that and in the light of all of the challenges we face, not least of which is climate change. I know there are people, I hope there are people from the Australian National Botanic Gardens here this week, including the National Seed Bank and nursery horticulturalists, and I'm very proud that representatives from my department will be showcasing their work in this national forum. It's going to be terrific to share stories about seed collecting and how we did that in alpine and grasslands regions that still remain an on, under ongoing threat from climate change and human impacts. And I look forward to them demonstrating how investing in seed collection and science combined with horticultural expertise can provide end-to-end -end solutions for conservation. I recognise the importance of seed banking as an effective long-term conservation tool. As well, a better knowledge of the biology and ecology of seeds helps conservation through understanding how they germinate, 
and how they respond to fire. It can also help optimise the seed supply chain for restoration and its outcomes. If a species is threatened in future years, actions can be taken to reverse species declines in the wild, utilising ex situ collections to bolster populations. So in response to the 2019-20 uh, megafires, the Australian Seed Bank Partnership has been coordinating seed banking and recovery work across the country, including in the seven worst affected regions in eastern and southern Australia, and many of you have been involved in that. And we, as the Australian government, support plant conservation through seed banking. In May uh, 2021, I unveiled designs for a $7.2 million state-of-the-art seed bank at the Australian National Botanic Gardens that will be built to secure native seed in the face of a changing climate and extreme weather. And I'm also proud to support the Australian Seed Bank Partnership's efforts to collect, germinate and store seeds from 200 bushfire effective native plants through a $1.5 million grant provided by our bushfire recovery program. That was a $200 million program. It was allocated to plants, to animals, to species recovery and so on. But I was always very um, committed to making sure that plants in our uh, expert panel were given their fair share of the action and Professor Rachel Gallagher is one of your keynote speakers today, I'm not sure if Rachel's here, um, but she's pretty incredible and, um, and, and her work on the Threatened Species Scientific Committee which is an ongoing standing committee that recommends to the Minister of the day uh, what species of plants and animals need to be listed as vulnerable and endangered so Rachel's performing an incredibly important role representing plant species on that committee. Um, we have, I know you're talking, we're talking about threatened species more broadly and under our first threatened species strategy, we've set ambitious targets which are to improve the trajectory of 30 threatened plants and of course the seed banking that I just mentioned. In the year five report on the strategy's progress, I was pleased to see that more than 67% of Australia's known threatened plant species stored in conservation seed banks, positioning Australia as a world leader in conservation seed banking, and that plants such as the blue top sun orchid had a much improved trajectory. So we've got a new threatened species strategy, 2021 to 31. It builds on the previous strategy to set a clear vision to recover our threatened plants, animals, and ecological communities. And I recently released a five-year action plan underpinning the strategy, identifying 30 priority plant species that will be targeted for recovery and that we as an Australian government will focus our absolute investment in. And the action plan also sets a new target of securing at least 80% of nationally listed threatened plant species in insurance collections, including nationally listed species impacted by myrtle rust. Through this strategy, the Australian government will continue to keep a very strong engagement and a very strong partnership between state governments, state agencies, First Nations people, business and community groups. And for all of you that represent those groups, so whether it be science or traditional knowledge or community groups such as land care, um, a very big thank you once again for the work that you do. And I hope you can soon get out of this somewhat windowless room and out into our beautiful natural environment. Thank you again. Thanks, Susan. Um, very timely, really, to reflect on work on threatened species, which we're also trying to deal with uh, today's, uh, this, this conference's sessions. And I also very much agree that um, the animals of the world get more attention than the plants. And that's something people who work on plants are constantly, I don't know, dealing with is the wrong word, but, you know, coping with, you might say. Um, but I like to say, you know, in support of plants that most of the habitats for the animals are plants so we've really got to work on everything and it's it's really good to highlight the interaction between those two different aspects or all the aspects of um, life on the planet thank you very much okay we're pretty much on time which is good um, the next uh, component is we're going to do a quick Mentimeter, um, which is just to work out where everybody's from. 
if we can quickly. So Amelia, ah, here we go. So if you use that um, instructions on your screen, you'll end up with a question. So we either use the QR code or just go straight to the web page. And there's a code number there to enter. And I presume those online can also do this. Yes, they can. The thumbs are up. And you'll see on the screen about 30 or so, 33 people have now logged on. And the simple question we're going to start with for this session is just where are you from? So we get some background on the diversity of where people are from, both in person and online. And not surprisingly, most people are from New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. But it's good to have a few. Our Tasmanian colleague and a couple from Queensland and WA. Clearly we'll have to work more collaboratively with Northern Territory and South Australia. Okay, thank you, Amelia. If we could have the next presentation, please. So I'd like to acknowledge to the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today, both here in Albury and for those who are sitting online in their own homes, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organising committee for who've worked tirelessly to get this conference uh, to you today. Um, they're on the left-hand side of your screen there. In particular, I'd like to thank Joe Lynch, Christine Fernandes, Amelia Martin Jensen, and Martin Driver, who've worked very, very hard, both Martin in Albury and the others outside of Albury, to get this conference um, happening today. Um, yeah. We were delayed for a year and we were never certain exactly what was going to happen with COVID, but it's great to see you all today here. I'd also like to thank the sponsors and partners we have to run the conference. ANPC is only a small organisation and you know, we need help uh, to get things to you and to interact with you, so it's great. Uh, you know, thank you for all those sponsors on that page as well. For those of you who are a little bit uncertain about... Um, uh, sorry, you can't touch it more than once. Um, what AMPC does, we're a network that essentially promotes um, plant conservation in Australia and, and beyond. And to highlight some of the things we've been doing recently, um, uh, here's three things that we've kind of developed or led the development of guidelines, best practice guidelines for conservation measures for plants. So if you're interested in moving plants about, have a look at our translocation guidelines. If you're interested in ex situ conservation of either common or threatened species, have a look at our germplasm guidelines. And if you're interested in using seed uh, for restoration purposes, have a look at our flora bank guidelines. They're three very topical and up-to-date examples of ANPC working collaboratively with a range of experts to deliver best practice management. And so hopefully we'll be able to do more of those and more types of things in the future. Today, the conference, Seeds to Recovery, you'll have to excuse my pointer, it's got four major themes. We've heard a little bit this morning from our guest speakers about bushfire recovery. We have a session to follow shortly on that. 
We're also going to look at the role of seeds in conservation, either for regeneration, revegetation, storage, etc. Seeds are very important things that allow plants to persist in landscapes. We're going to have a focus on the conservation of both threatened species and threatened ecological communities. And finally, we've got a session which is a very important session because it tries to say how do we engage with people to get plant conservation done? And it's a really important question and one we have to try and achieve if we're going to be successful. I want to just add a few of my own points. Um, so I've worked for a long time on plant conservation in a range of different systems, but also on fire ecology of plants and how they respond to fire. So a few comments from me on the major fires we had in 2019-20. Kind of lucky in a, in a strange way that the conference was delayed because we're now in a much better position to look at how well things are recovering or not from those fires. Um, we've had a little bit more time to get people out in the field to look at things. We're try starting to ask questions about which plants and ecosystems were affected, how were they impacted, what were the factors that drove those impacts. And essentially we're trying to then understand how we can improve fire management for conservation of plants using all the available sources of knowledge we have, including Indigenous knowledge. So I'll give you one example of some work I've been doing. Um, on a bank, bank is a very common, particularly in southwestern WA and in eastern Australia. This particular bank here, a species called Pallidosa subspecies atrolux, is found just west of Sydney in a small patch, a bush. It's killed by fire, so on the top left you have a plant. The bottom left is just a dead stick there. It was burnt in the 2019-20 fires. Now on the right hand side you can see some seedlings coming up. And for tens of thousands of years, this is the sort of process that's occurred naturally in many systems around the country for recovery of plants after fire. But things are changing. Climate is warming. We're getting perhaps more frequent and severe fires, more drought, more flooding rains if you're in the east coast of Australia at the moment. We've also cleared habitat. So fires don't behave in the same way they did before. We're changing the fire regimes and we're adding a range of threats, be they biotic threats such as weeds, pests and pathogens, or abiotic threats such as uh, droughts, floods, erosion. So for this particular species, um, there's a thing, I like to think of a way to think about how it's impacted by fire by looking at its life history or life cycle. So we have adult plants, they, um, you can go out in the bush and see them. They produce fruits, woody fruits, which sit in their canopy. You can see and count the fruits. They all get killed by fire, every single thing, living plant in this species if they get burnt. But the seeds are protected within the woody fruits from the lethal heat from the fire just like seeds are protected in the soil for other species. And then you get the seedlings after the fire. And so I want to just ask the question, how was this species impacted by the 2019-20 fires? And what we tended to find was that in some patches, uh, the um, seedlings you could see came up and that looked pretty good. But in other patches of this species, uh, we seem to get virtually no seedlings. So all the plants are killed, but there's virtually no seedlings under them. Why is this the case? So in this case, it's likely that some of the plants never got to maturity. They didn't have any fruits on them. So they're being burnt too frequently and they can't tolerate being burnt too frequently. Other plants had some fruits, but they hadn't really reached peak seed production and so they couldn't produce enough seeds and seedlings to replace the standing population. So again, this is a component of the fire regime that's becoming particularly important and hopefully Rachel will sort of carry on from this. Uh, understanding the impacts of high fire frequency on plants can really eliminate some species or reduce their populations very quickly. At the same time in this species we had 
a lot of fruits like you'll see in the right hand side there that are open sitting in the, on the plant in unburnt areas that all the seeds have been released so they have no seeds available when a fire comes and we think droughts have uh, cause opening of those fruits and loss of the seeds from the plants and those seeds are then lost and not available to turn into seedlings after the fire so a combination of a warming climate excessive drought and high fire frequency has impacted this particular species so that's just my little lesson about fire and understanding the mechanisms of change and then building those sort of understandings into how do we manage fire for this particular species? How do we allow enough time between fires that we ensure there's plenty of seeds available that it can recruit adequately after fire? And that kind of leads me on uh, to our next session, which is all about bushfire recovery. And could I ask the um, three speakers for the next session to come up to the stage now, please? And we'll just prepare for them. first uh, speaker in the bushfire recovery session, our keynote speaker, is Associate Professor Rachel Gallagher. I've known Rachel for a number of years and it's been an absolute pleasure to collaborate and work with her and she's one of the leading plant ecologists in the country. So to me it's a great honour to have her here today. Um, she trained as a plant ecologist, passionate about plant ecology, passionate about contributing her knowledge to protection of plant species. Uh, I knew her for a long time working at Macquarie University. She's now at Western Sydney University uh, at the Institute, Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment. Um, she was awarded the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Early Career Research in Biological Sciences in recognition of her national assessment of the impacts of the 2019-20 bushfire season on 26,000 Australian plant species, which when you think about it, is an absolutely enormous task, given you know, the, the, the mammal people looked at what, 20, 30, 40? Um, the scale of the attempt is enormous, and it's really great that we're actually taking on the challenge as plant ecologists to do this sort of work. So I'd just like to hand over now to Rachel, and welcome Rachel to the stage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tony. I must say, Tony Ord's been such a um, wonderful mentor to me, and I'm so I'm so proud and humbled to be able to give a, a keynote talk at this conference. Uh, and I'm just going to time myself so I don't speak forever, because I feel like I could about Australian plant conservation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wiradjuri people, uh, on the lands in which we're meeting, and all of the lands where everyone's meeting online. I'm from the Darug Nation uh, on the central coast of New South Wales. So, mega challenges for Australian plant diversity. I'm not only going to talk about fires, I also want to talk about land clearing and just give a nod to some restoration uh, projects which are happening in my lab as well. So, for us, we know the Australian flora is locally precious. You know, we are all here together because of our love of the Australian flora and a lot of us have dedicated our lives to understanding it um, from an ecological and biological perspective. But I also want to remind us that it's globally significant as well. So most of the plant species in Australia occur nowhere else on Earth. And so that's approximately 90% of the species in Australia, which are endemic to our country. Uh, and that makes us pretty heavy hitters globally as well. So this map here is something that um, Tony's working on this paper as well. So this is looking at global shortfalls in extinction risk assessments for endemic flora across the globe. So these five countries here in blue have more than 10,000 species which are endemic to them. And so Australia's in the top five in terms of endemic species around the globe. This map here is devised from 
the world checklist of vas vascular plant species, which is a huge project that's just been uh, finished and minted by Q, and you can read more about it in the preprint, uh, sorry, in the printed paper that I've referenced here on the slide. And so we're busily uh, incorporating this new data set into a revision of this paper. Uh, so in, in terms of the, the size of the Australian flora, you know, it represents about 8% of the global flora, so it's not an insignificant amount of uh, the species that have evolved and which are sustained in environments across the world. And of course, we have major radi radiations in uh, some of the fantastic plant families that we all know and love, like Proteaceae and the Myrtaceae. And these assemble, our, our flora assembles into a wide range of different biomes uh, and major vegetation groups. So we're lucky enough to have arid zones to work in, alpine zones to work in, savannas, uh, all, all kinds of fantastic different vegetation types. So we are, we do have major lessons that can be learned from the Australian flora in terms of the extreme climates that we're exposed to in Australia and how plants are going to respond to those. And so I'd like for us all to, you know, think think clearly about how uh, globally significant the flora is for, um, for the rest of the world here in Australia. But of course, with great flora comes great responsibility. Uh, and although it's a bit of a joke that I've put that on the slide, uh, it's true. Uh, and as Minister Lay alluded, I've worked uh, quite a bit in uh, using legislative instruments in Australia to get protections for plant species um, under law. Uh, and what we're doing uh, with this uh, particular piece of work is to think about the global strategy for plant conservation and what its goals were for 2011 to 2020. In particular, objective one, which was about uh, plant diversity being well understood, documented and recognised. And target two in particular of this part of the GSPC was having an assessment of the conservation status of all known plant species as far as possible to guide conservation action. So all known plant species, we're talking, you know, somewhere in the order of 350,000 conservation assessments being completed. So a very ambitious target. And sadly, we have fallen fairly short of that target. And that's what this paper here from colleagues at Kew uh, have, has shown. So this is published in Conservation Biology in 2018. So it's four years ago, and there's been quite a bit of progress in conservation assessments since that time. But what it shows is up the y-axis there is the proportion of the plant family that's been assessed, so that's had an extinction risk or a threat assessment completed, and then the size of the family. And pondering this picture at Journal Club one afternoon, I kind of looked at that, that uh, little spot there for Myrtaceae, and I thought, well, that's Australia's problem, isn't it? Given the huge radiation of Myrtaceae within Australia, and the fact that you know the majority of those species occur here and nowhere else, it really is our responsibility to be doing a better job at assessing species in Myrtaceae. And this then kind of got me thinking, and colleagues thinking, well, you know, how many endemic species in each country do actually have a conservation assessment? Given that conservation protections are usually doled out at the national level, it's important for us to know this kind of thing. Um, you know, we can have global strategies, but it's really at the national level that we're able to sort of afford protection to species. And so we've been exploring this, and this is how it, how it looks globally with the data set that we've used to date. And we are in the process of updating it, but I don't expect it to change a huge amount. So this shows us the proportion of endemic plant species in each country and around the world that has an extinction risk assessment. And so obviously we're going from dark red being pretty dire, somewhere up to about 20%, through to those yellow countries where we have somewhere in the order of 60 to 80, oh sorry, 80 to 100% of the uh, species which have been assessed. So Australia's not, not doing so great. We're somewhere around a third of the flora has been assessed using a conservation assessment. And that compares pretty starkly to those other countries which are in that top five of endemic species from around the world. So places like China, where uh, in our analysis, we see that there's 70% of species which have been assessed. Uh, and there's also papers in the literature using a different um, foundational taxonomy that show that the Chinese have actually looked at 100% of their endemic species and run an IUCN red list assessment for them. And in South Africa, 
85% of the endemic flora of South Africa has a threat assessment completed. And, you know, it started to make us wonder, well, it's, what's it about? Is it about how much money a country has? Well, no, it's not. So there's, on this graph here, we see along the bottom is our, how much money, how wealthy a country might be. So the gross domestic product along the bottom there, a fairly crude measure of wealth, but a fairly accepted one. And then the proportion of endemic species in each of those countries with a threat assessment. We see that there's basically no relationship there. So those rich countries like Australia and the United States, you know, the USA is doing a better job with us than us with a relatively similar GDP. And similarly, it's really not about the amount of threat that species are posed either. So we look at those projected changes in temperature by 2070 or the percentage of permanent deforestation. We don't really see a relationship between countries uh, and, uh, and threat assessment progress. So how can we accelerate flora conservation goals in Australia? That's why we're all here. And it's so great to be in person and be able to talk to you all during the week before I have to go off to Threatened Species Committee meeting on Wednesday, which the minister failed to mention. <laughs> uh, so how can we do it? Well, we can combine information sources to build knowledge um, and design actions. So that's one of the core things that the AMPC does. Oops, it is a quick trigger. Oh, hey, there we go. And so we're really lucky in Australia now that you know the, the early botanists would have been absolutely floored by the amount of uh, resources that are now available to us to understand the flora. So we've got genomics projects at the national scale, we have a national traits database, we have millions of uh, occurrence records in the AVH, a seed bank partnership and TURN where we can get access to remote sensing information. So a huge amount of information at our fingertips. But I guess what the, where the synthesis lies is really in combining all these information sources to build knowledge and design actions. And that's what I'm going to showcase um, around the fires and the vulnerability assessment that Tony modestly uh, failed to mention his instrumental role in when he was introducing my talk. Uh, and secondly, we can work together on common goals and pull in the same direction to bring the best science to decision makers. And I think that that's something that we're all really passionate about doing in the room. And if we're not, then we probably should be because you know, injecting our science into how decisions are made is really um, a really instrumental way that we, can, that we can progress plant conservation. And I really enjoyed, and I put a shout out to our editor, uh, Heidi Zimmer, who's pulled together this great edition of the 30th anniversary uh, of Australasian plant conservation where we can look back and see what's been achieved over those 30 years. And I personally really enjoyed reading this on a Sunday afternoon. So I'll talk rather briefly about the fires actually because I think you know we know about the vulnerability assessments that were done. And as Tony said, we're really interested in getting out into the field now and we'll be hearing from some great speakers during the week. Uh, who are out in the field and looking, you know, what's actually happening and understanding what's happening with species. So we know that the fires burnt across 10 million hectares or so of the Australian uh, landscape. And there was a huge focus on the southeast, but I do want to spend a moment to say that there were also significant impacts in South Australia and Western Australia, in particular on Kangaroo Island uh, and in the Stirling Ranges National Park in Western Australia. And although the Australian flora is exquisitely adapted to fire and has evolved with fire over millions of years, it's really about the changing fire regimes and those threats that interact uh, with fire which prevent uh, recovery, and they're the real key management challenges. So it's not really about there being a fire. A lot of the times plants have been dying for a fire. They've wanted to come, needed a fire to come through to increase recruitment for many, many years. But really, it's about those changes in fire regimes that cause biodiversity decline that are really important for management. So this is a very busy slide. And of course, I don't expect you to be able to take it all in. Um, but I did want to show that the way that we went about looking at 26,000 different plant species was through a really structured set of criteria and it was Tony who was the brainchild of this uh, piece of particular work, working in collaboration with Mark Uwe and others, David Keith, um, old colleagues of his who he's worked through for a long time. And uh, 
you know, as, as Tony said, it was, it was a real national conversation about what was happening with animals after the fire. And it was really a couple of determined people who stood up and said, we need to do something about plants and came up really rapidly with this approach um, that was then rolled out across the country that meant that we're you know, able to secure a bunch of funding and get a lot of work done over the last couple of years. So each species was assessed against 10 different criteria. And those criteria are in those coloured boxes down the side. So some of them are about abiotic conditions, so pre the interactive effects of fire and drought, for instance, so pre-fire drought, uh, and the mechanisms of post-fire decline that are associated with that. So we might see reductions in survival and internally stored resources for re-sprouting in species that are exposed to drought before fire. Uh, we also looked at fire regime impacts, so short-term, short fire intervals and how they may shape species, um, species responses after the 2019-20 fires, high fire severity, and criterion J down the bottom there, which is exposure to future high frequency fire impacts. So, you know, thinking about that Banksia palidosa, you know, that, that now exists mainly as an immature population. And another fire that comes through for that species before it's had a chance to recover, that's going to end, you know, we can all see that that's going to end fairly catastrophically for the species. So uh, we gathered data um, to assess uh, each species against each of these criteria and then classified species into high, medium, low and um, no vulnerability categories. And you can read about this in a couple of papers that you'll see kind of peppered through, if, um, through the rest of the talk. Um, we used information on species ranges from two sources. So we used point locations, which are you know, based on verified herbarium specimens um, uh, from the AVH. But then we also have a suite of range maps that have been developed for the Australian flora which are based on climate and soil conditions, uh, and we use those as a second line of evidence. We combined these sources with information on species traits, so uh, information about whether they were obligate seeding or resprouting, for instance, uh, inf information about their growth form and their potential, using that to infer their potential fire intervals. And then we looked at threats like high fire frequency, which is shown here from fire history data sets, and also threats such as disease and fire interactions, post-fire drought, uh, and post-fire feral animal occurrence. So what did we find? Well, we found, of course, that fire impacts were really widespread across the Australian flora. And I, I don't, of course, expect you to be able to read this phylogenetic tree, but it's every family in the Australian flora. And the two coloured kind of circles around the side show the percentage of species in that family which were burnt. And the thing to take away from this, I guess, is you can see from here just how widespread the impacts were. You know, the fires weren't affecting just one small um, proportion of the Australian flora. We see those yellow boxes all throughout um, the phylogenetic tree. So a really widespread impact. So 79% of Proteaceae, for instance, 65% of Fabaceae, and 67% of Myrtaceae species had some of their range burnt. And of course, the main thing that all this vulnerability assessment was for was to direct funding to places where we should be getting out into the field to follow up with priority flora. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, put a shout out to Libby Rumpf, who is editing a book for CSIRO, which will be out later this year. Um, where we've looked at, um, you know, they've looked across the impacts of the fire on all kinds of organisms, but there is a chapter in here about plants and what's been happening in the field and bringing back stories from the field to compare what's been happening, well, compare what uh, we found relative to the vulnerability assessments. Oops. Um, so just to give you a feel for which of the criterion uh, most species were ranked high against, there were really things to do with the fire regime. So interactive effects of, um, of oh, sorry, so high fire severity, but also future risk of high fire frequency. So there's 291 species that we identified, like this obligate seeding cycad species here, where the adults are killed by the fire, there's only immature individuals remaining, and then another fire prior to maturity is a key threat for this species. Um, 
And a lot of these species are forming part of the species that we're looking at as part of the 10, fire bush, 10 point bushfire response plan for the Threatened Species Committee. So doing EPBC Act assessments of these species with information that's coming in from the field. Um, and it's an ongoing job. So that's all I'll say directly about fire, because there's, you know, there's always a plethora of, of threats in Australia that we can discuss and think about. And you know, putting together a slide like this is always pretty sobering. So these are all the currently listed threatened, um, key threatening processes under the EPBC Act. But there's one in particular that I want to talk about for a few moments, and that's land clearance. So big, it can be seen from space. <laughs> so normally you see a picture of a bulldozer when someone wants to talk about land clearing, but actually I think it's more powerful to show, especially what's happening on the eastern seaboard and the southern parts of the country in the southwest of Western Australia, just how much land clearing we've managed to accomplish in the short, very short 230 years worth of time. So we've started to think about, well, what's the fate of Australian plants? in terms of uh, their ranges being cleared or protected. So I've just mapped here. So a lot of what I do is spatial analysis, although I do love to get out into the field as well, so please don't, please don't think of me as someone who's behind a desk all the time. Um, so these two uh, maps here show cleared area in Australia and protected area in Australia. Um, and, you know, look at Tassie. I mean, it's basically a mirror image, isn't it? It's like you're either cleared or you're protected in that place. And so we're really interested in, and this is work that's led by Vanessa Adams, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Tasmania. And so we were interested in intersecting those species range maps, which we developed as um, part of the fire work, um, with protected and cleared areas across Australia to get a bit of a feel for what's happening. Oh no, there goes my graph. Okay, so you can imagine here. <laughs> so this is a histogram that shows the percentage of the range which has been cleared um, across Australia. And basically what it does show, should it have been a little bit more aligned, would show that the majority, um, that on average about 28% of the geographic range of plant species in Australia have been cleared. And you know you can see that big black bar off to the edge there. That's the zero to 10 category. So there are plenty of species, and that's in the order of sort of 8,000 species there, that have a pretty small proportion of their range which have been cleared. But then there are these ones up in this top. Uh, oh, there's the graph, hooray. So there are these ones up in that top band, the 90 to 100% of their ranges which have been cleared. And we'll just take a quick look at some of those. Um, so it wouldn't be a keynote talk without some orchid. So here we go. Prasophyllum uh, anticum, pretty hill leek orchid. So this is, you know, these are the locations where this species is found, pretty cleared. And when you look, whoop, and I even zoomed in to look, come on, there we go. This is the pretty hill flora reserve where this species is found. So it's a very tiny little slither of protected area that this species occurs in. But of course, it's more than just orchids. It's not just the orchids that we need to think about. Something like Acacia torticarpa, 97% of its suitable habitat has been cleared in the southwest of Western Australia. And it's not just narrow-ranged endemic species too, which are in this um, 90 to, uh, which have more than 70% of their range cleared. So there's more than 500 species in Australia which have ranges that are 20,000 kilometres or more that have had 70% of their suitable habitat cleared. So that's pretty gloomy. So let's look to the other side of the coin, which is protected area. So on average, it's about the same. 25% uh, of the geographic, of, geographic range of plant species has been protected in Australia. And about 47% of the flora meet that 17% target. So there's the 17% target for protected areas across the globe. And looking at a species level, we've got about 50% of our species which have 17% of their, of their suitable habitat protected. So really what it's about is uh, thinking about these two graphs together. The key question then becomes sort of how many and which species continue to be at risk from clearing into the future. 
So, for instance, you know, for looking on the, on the left at the percentage of range which has been cleared, could those ranges, which are very, you know, for those species which have very small proportions of their range cleared, um, could they be cleared into the future? And how can we get, on the right-hand side there, how can we get those species which have a very small proportion of their range in the protected area network, how can we get them in protected areas in coming decades? And if we take those two groups together, there's about three, there's 3,665 unique species that occur in those boxes that have little of their range which has been cleared and little of their range which is in a protected area. So the key question then becomes, where are they, you know, how, how exposed are these species to potential clearing into the future? And so that's what's shown potentially in this map here. So this is a map of agricultural capability of uh, area across Australia, and the black parts over the top there show those cleared areas and then the protected areas and these areas of high capability for agriculture. And so that's what's um, shown in this graph here. And we'll focus on these 65 critical species. So most of their range is not cleared or in a protected area but 50% or more of their range is in lands that are targeted, that could be targeted for agriculture in coming years. So what kinds of species are they? Well, there's a lot in the Cape York. These two species are um, Cape York endemics, uh, Combretum trifoliatum, Eliocarpus magii. Eliocarpus is currently, um, oh no, I think the Eliocarpus, sorry, is a Tiwi Island species, um, and is currently under assessment under the EPBC Act. And then we've got species which are basically unknown to us other than their taxonomic descriptions. So things like Indigophora polyclada and Glycine gracii. You might not know Glycine gracii, but you probably know it's, it's crop relative. So Glycine is the uh, crop relative of soybean. Uh, and, you know, Australia is home to some of the world's, uh, some of the crop relatives which are adapted to some of the most extreme conditions globally, and so they're a really important resource. Their genes are a really important resource, resource for agriculture. And in fact, we've been lucky enough to be given a seven-year ARC Centre of Excellence to look at just that question. How can we bring back in those traits and those genes which have been bred out of crops from, from those crop wild relatives, bring those back in to make more resilient crops into the future? And so, uh, the wonderful Christine Beveridge is the lead of this at UQ and we have a node at Western Sydney University and there's plenty of opportunities for PhD students and postdocs so if working in agriculture is something that you're interested in uh, and bringing conservation to this uh, is something you're interested in then please get in touch with me. It seems, you know, these unknown and unprotected species, you know, it seems pretty short-sighted to potentially clear uh, habitat that contains Glycine gracii if it's going to be uh, a uh, something that's really important to agriculture in terms of the genetic diversity that it holds. Oops. But of course it's not just, you know, these unknown species in more remote areas. There's also something like Pultonia rodwayi, you know, occurs right near the Sydney region. Lots of people go walking in this area. It's close to major population centres but there's been so few field visits that it's been incredibly difficult to assess this species under the EPBC Act. And so we've been thinking about ways in our lab to go about looking at these unknown and unprotected species and harnessing some of the community science that goes on to gather data on what we're calling the priority plants. And I've brought along my my field guide uh, and I have a bunch of them here, so if you're interested in one, um, please come and see me about it. So Flora Connections is a project that's being driven forward by Ruby Stevens, who's a PhD student with me, and Desi Kintans, who is a postdoc at Western Sydney. Uh, it's supported by the Australian government's um, bushfire recovery program and is a collaboration with the Atlas of Living Australia and Western Sydney. And what we've done is developed a, uh, a guide uh, which uses the IUCN Red List criteria um, as, its, as its basis uh, and makes a very uh, simple uh, or simplified protocol for how to collect information in the field that will be useful for IUCN red list assessments. And so it's all outlined in our booklet here 
Uh, and then uh, when data is collected in the field, it can be submitted via the, yeah, via the Flora Connections uh, website, which DESI has developed. And there's a suite of priority plants that can be found on the website as well. So this is one way we're, that we're trying to you know, close that gap around unknown and unprotected species. And the information that comes in will go straight into the ALA and can then be used for um, project officers in the, uh, who are doing assessments at the state and federal level. So the last thing I want to say, I've got four minutes left and I'll be quick, <laughs> is thinking about restoring diversity at scale. And this is something that I'm quite new to as, a, um, as an area of research interest and there's a huge amount of work and I acknowledge you know, the amount of excitement that I have about talking to people about restoration and the huge opportunities that are there for us in the emerging uh, carbon market. So we have an Australian Research Council linkage um, grant and of course it involves drones. Everyone loves a drone, um, some people don't. But, uh, so we work with a company um, in Sydney called Airseed Technologies. Uh, it's a collaborative project with the Australian, um, with uh, Macquarie, the Royal Botanic Gardens, and there's some folks in the audience who are part of our team, and the University um, of Tasmania. So Airseed are uh, harnessing pelleting technology. So they're pelleting their seeds. It's been used quite a lot in agriculture. Um, as a technique for improving seed distribution. Uh, but it's not, not so much been used in native plant restoration. And so we're doing some of the fundamental science that's around, well, how many native species can you actually germinate uh, in these seed pods and how can we distribute them across the landscape? So this is the work of uh, Matt, my master's student. Um, so there's a picture there of the seed pellets which are created by Airseed. He's running glasshouse trials at the moment. He and Paige, another student, there's about 50 species that they're trialling these pods for, native, native plant species from Cumberland Plain woodland. Uh, we're trialling different soil amendments being included in the pods. We're trialling um, uh, different germination stimulants and we're looking at the role of microorganisms in the rhizosphere. And we're finding interesting things. So for instance, we're finding that encapsulated seeds, so seeds that are embedded in either a basic pod or an amended pod that has a, a microbial amendment, are um, doing better in terms of the amount of biomass that they're putting on uh, in these growth trials. And they're also doing better in terms of the number of days until emergence. Our next step is to get out in the field and do some pellet delivery trials. So we've got one running hopefully next week, I think, Pete, at, uh, maybe next week, yeah, at, um, at uh, Mount Annan Botanic Gardens. Ironically, it's been too wet now. First it was too dry, then too fiery, and now it's too wet. Um, but these uh, technologies can deliver about 40,000 pellets um, per day, and you can uh, create a biodiverse planting schema with them as well, where the drone can be loaded up with hoppers with different species that can then be planted into the landscape. And then uh, the guys at Airseed have some advanced high resolution imagery capacity and some uh, ability to use their artificial intelligence to track growth of individual seed pods in the field. And we're going to look at that in terms of its cost effectiveness relative to tube stock planting. And they're going to tie it all together in a bow about, uh, by looking at science for biodiverse plantings in the carbon market. So. I think we're all stronger together. It's all great to be here in person and I really look forward to talking to you all. Come and get a copy of the guide. Please promote it in your community networks uh, and I can take any questions at the end. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. We're gonna take uh, uh, questions both in-house and online. After we've heard three speakers, we'll have a time for questions then. So my, our next speaker is um, Dr. Richard Davies. Richard got his PhD from Flinders University, he studied uh, endangered mound spring plant. He's been working for 40 years on conservation government, industry, NGOs. He's now a Research has research fellowships at CSIRO, Flinders University and UNSW. He's kind of been interested in impacts of grazing and fire ecology on both seed banks, soil seed banks and orchids. I think I ran into Richard many decades ago um, 
on an arid zone acacia work, um, something that fascinated me for a number of years. And it's great to see you again, Richard, and have you here today. So over to you. I'm uh, talking today about uh, threatened flora on Kangaroo Island affected by uh, the bushfires of 2020. Um, in summer 2019-20, almost half of Kangaroo Island was burnt out by deadly bushfires. These fires left few areas of unburnt uh, bushland on western Kangaroo Island. This is uh, important because Kangaroo Island is home to 29 plant species which are rare and threatened and endemic, and endemic to the island. There was concern as to how well these plants would regenerate given the severity of the fires and the range of post-fire threats such as weeds and browsing. Our study surveyed the fire recovery of 17 of these rare and threatened species, those that were significantly affected by these bushfires. Our focus was private land and roadsides and comparing areas subject to different burning intensities. The aim was to document the mode and extent of recovery and to identify threats to recovery and persistence. To do this, we set up long-term monitoring programs. Using our findings, we initiated recovery works using students and local volunteers. The species we worked on uh, were four EPBC-listed species, a um, species listed as threatened under the National Parks and Wildlife Act of South Australia and and 11 species listed as rare under that same uh, state legislation. We set up 35 small quadrats uh, to provide monitoring data on the target species, but we also set up 13 larger squad quadrats to monitor all associated plant species. These larger quadrats were aimed at determining how long obligate seed regenerators take to reach maturity and produce adequate seed to tolerate a subsequent burn, and also to monitor the impact of invading Tasmanian blue gums. These quadrats provided an opportunity for senior high school students on Kangaroo Island to undertake research projects. And the quadrats were scattered all over western, the western end of the island. Um, from these, this monitoring, we worked out that um, all 17 species were able to regenerate after the fire, even though, even though the fire was very intense in places, uh, but only four regenerated mostly or totally by reshooting from rhizomes. The remaining 13 were obligate seed regenerators, uh, thus only able to regenerate from seed when burnt. However, however, three of these obligate seed regenerators had occasional live escapes due to their being protected by limestone pockets or proximity to permanent waters. Uh, a big range of issues uh, or threats um, to successful post-fire 
survival of proper gills was identified. Uh, as has been spoken about already, inappropriate fire regime was one such threat. Um, we used fire frequency data in nature maps to determine fire frequency at our monitoring sites and other sites where our target species survived. Um, and from this we worked out inappropriate fire management ranged from two frequent fires on the western end of the island and two infrequent fires on the eastern end of the island. Another factor we studied was the effect of different fire severities on the regeneration of the various species. This we did by measuring the fire severity at our monitoring sites using the minimum stem diameter method. This provided data on fire intensity, intensity and frequency thresholds for each species. Of interest was the ability of some small species, such as Chiranthera volubilis, to quickly regenerate and flower even after the most intensive fire. Um, and this is due to them having uh, deep perennial root stocks. As, would be, as is expected, some species benefited greatly from the high fire frequency at the west end of the island, uh, and there's a couple of species that seem to be under no threat from present fire regime or future fire regimes. On the other hand, conversely, some other species like the um, EPBC, EPBC listed Leonema equestri, uh, which are confined to the eastern end of KI, the threat is too infrequent fires. Uh, fortunately, one of the major populations of this species was burnt out by the 2020 fire, and you can see from these diagrams that the species um, benefited by regenerating um, readily from seed as a result of the fire. However, these seedlings were subsequently heavily browsed by macropods following the fire. Our monitoring showed that seedling numbers declined by half over the first winter following the fire. However, we prevented further decline by, con by constructing an exclosure around most of the population. And this shows the exclosure protecting the site from macropod browsing. Uh, a big threat to obligate seed generators is climate change causing more frequent and severe bushfires and droughts. Um, two pro following the bushfire in January 2020, two prolonged dry spells occurred in the following summer autumn uh, and this had a variable effect on different obligate seed regenerators. Species occurring in limestone pockets such as Spiridium tepuranum were able to survive by the fact that uh, runoff uh, into the pockets where they occurred occurred um, due to the limestone surrounding area. This species also uh, had the ability to germinate in both summer and winter rains and over more than one season and this benefited the species. Similarly, um, here's a couple of other species which occur in limestone pockets that have done okay despite that dry period. Um, these species, you can see in the bottom right hand corner here, um, benefited from having occurring also in limestone pockets which protected the plants. So you got quite a few life escapes, plants that even though the species was vulnerable to fire, there was plants occurring in pockets where the fire didn't actually get to. On the other hand, we found obligate seed regenerators on lateritic soils such as Ligania scabrella had seedlings vulnerable to drought. So over that period I talked about, of, of uh, two dry, dry periods, 50% of seedlings died over that first, period, first summer. Another issue with climate change is more frequent and severe floods. Um, Obligate seed regen regenerators such as Coriocalocyna variety Halmacherurum, which occurs along major rivers, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, in the case of this species, 66% 66, 66 of adults survived after the fire uh, in unburnt vegetation on the banks of the permanently flowing Demol River. However, a flash flood in 2022 as a result of 150 mils of rain falling in eight hours gouged out this whole river um, basin. Um, and also, th even though there, there was still seedlings surviving, these were very vulnerable to the drought 
and will, will also be um, affected if the fire happens before they reach maturity since they're uh, totally um, vulnerable to, to can't survive a fire. So the situation now is we've got a species uh, which is confined to six adults and 470 seedlings occurring over a very restricted area. Another threat we looked at was um, Phytophthora, which is a major threat in Kangaroo Island, where it's uh, pretty widespread. Um, rare clonal species such as Hachia enigma, enigma are particularly vulnerable, especially on roadsides where Phytophthora is now being spread by, is being spread all the time by earth moving equipment. Uh, ongoing monitor, monitoring will enable us to determine the vulnerability of this Hachia to this threat. So you can see that the size on the right has declined, but at this stage we're not sure if that's due to Phytophthora or some other factor. Pigs, weeds and hydro hydrological change are particular, a particular threat to species in wetter areas. And one species that particularly was vulnerable was Aspirilla tetraphylla, which is confined to only two rivers on Kangaroo Island and covers only 10 square metres in totality. Um, due to its oxbow habitat, Oxbow Lake habitat is particularly vulnerable to hydrological change and flash flooding and to weed invasion and digging by feral pigs. Uh, we've contributed towards a major pig eradication program, but uh, despite our ac active site management, most populations continue to decline. So we're actually nom nominating this species as critically endangered under the EPBC Act. One of the biggest threats, however, is Tasmanian bluegum invasion from adjacent burnt plantations. Um, Tasmanian bluegum seedlings are invading roadside vegetation adjacent to Flinders Chase National Park and other areas of native vegetation and threatening EPBC listed species such as Chiranthera volubilis. You can see from this picture all these uh, shaded green areas are, uh, uh, next to the park are all Tasmanian bluegum. Uh, and while NCS volunteers and, and other NGOs have been actively involved removing Tasmanian bluegum over the last two years, 60% of the infestations still need treatment. Uh, while doing this uh, removal of Tasmanian bluegum, we collected important data, uh, including information on the density of seedlings in different habitats, best methods to kill Tasmanian bluegum seedlings, and the need for follow-up uh, weeding. While we found Tasmanian bluegum to, on average, penetrate less than 40 metres into adjacent areas, in dry areas, in wet areas, it, spread, it was found to, to spread 600 metres or more down creek lines in the first year alone. And we found seedlings in wet areas growing six metres in the first two years after the fire. For this reason, we, our project concentrated on Tasmanian bluegum removal using our 50 volunteers. And I'd like to thank these uh, volunteers and all our other project partners. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I think we're back on time, which is good. Um, as I said, questions will come after our next speaker. Our next speaker is Erica Roper. Hi, Erica. Um, from New South Wales Department of Planning and Environment. Uh, Erica is a threatened species officer working under the Saving Our Species Program, which is the State Government of New South Wales Threatened Species Conservation Program, which has been going for just over five years now, I think five to six years or so, and has been quite effective at resourcing species conservation measures within the state. She's a soft spot for orchids and cockatoos and works on various threatened plants and animals. It's good to see both interact. Thank you, Erica. Erica's going to talk today on it's a grass, it's a twig, no, it's a super bum. <laughs> Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes? I'm also going to time myself because I can talk about super bum forever. And nobody wants that. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. So thanks for the introduction, Tony. Um, in my previous life, I worked on black cockatoos, but now I am becoming a plant person, so you don't need to shun me anymore. It's all good. 
Um, so, yeah, I'm here to uh, tell you everything that we know about Genoplesium superbum, also known as the superb mitch orchid, also known as superbum. So just in case anyone is new to orchids, uh, orchids are weird. Um, we've got 12 to 1400 native orchid species in Australia and they come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes, which often means that they have highly specialised pollinators. Some orchid species are only pollinated by one insect species. Uh, they're not found above ground all year and their emergence is often influenced by uh, weather phenomenon like um, fire or uh, rain um, and uh, long droughts can suppress their emergence. Um, but they are still there sometimes because they spend a lot of the year below ground as a tuber and then they'll pop up a leaf and a stem to flower when the conditions are right. So introducing the star of the show today, we have Superbum, the Superb Midge Orchid. They are endangered and we know only uh, less than 300 individuals um, are found from about six populations on Yuin and Gundungara country, uh, east of the Shoalhaven River, River near Braidwood, Neriga and in Morton National Park. They are really quite tiny, uh, as you can see, those are my fingers, I have relatively small hands. Um, they flower in late summer and early autumn and they smell like raspberries. So imagine a cross between red frogs, Alan's red frogs and raspberry sherbet. That's what Superbum smells like. Delicious, right? You kind of want to eat one. Unfortunately, so do the herbivores. So in some areas, they are highly threatened by wombats and wallabies uh, eating them. And in other places, they're threatened by roadworks and also limited pollination. And I told you they were tiny. Um, this is again my finger, and that is a emerging stem. Um, less than a centimetre tall. They're very, very small and difficult to find. So this is a patch of orchid habitat. Um, apologies, my slides seem to have gone a bit wonky. Um, and you are in an advantage here because this picture is um, much bigger than real life. So there's at least seven orchids in this picture. Uh, can anyone, anyone see any yet? <laughs> I'm seeing a few nods. Uh, well, I've circled the seven that I know of, um, and that's only because I've been to this site numerous times, so I recognise that bush, I know exactly where they are. But there's quite possibly more in there that I couldn't see in the photo. Brief history of the species, uh, they were found, we have records from the late 80s, early 90s and into the early 2000s from Morton, uh, Neriga, Braidwood, and then there are some up in Lithgow as well. Uh, SOS monitors six populations now, three in Morton National Park, which were burnt, two on roadsides and one on private property, which were unburnt. And since the Saving Our Species program started, uh, no plants were found in 2017 or 2018, and only four plants were found in February 2019. So I'm sure you all recall, we were in a big drought back then. So this is Morton National Park in 2015, before the fires. And as you can see, it's quite lush with thick forest, thick understory. And if we fast forward from 2015 to 2020, we have the Karawan fire burned there for just over two months, um, burnt over uh, almost 500,000 hectares. And all the orchid habitat in Morton was burnt uh, it was like a moonscape up there. Uh, this photo um, was one that Gavin sent me. It's cut off his last name, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, nothing, nothing left. Um, in early 2020, there was a big rainfall event um, which suppressed the fire, fortunately, and also likely triggered the flowering event. And one ironically positive um, the thing that came out of the fires is that because all the other vegetation was cleared out, it made detectability really, really easy for the orchids. As you can see here, there's just orchid stems with flowers poking up straight out of the, the ash. Um, so definitely increased detectability. And so this allowed SOS to actually collect some meaningful data uh, on this species. So population monitoring 
um, individual plants were pinned. We collected demographic data and we did seed collection at all of the sites, so burnt and unburnt. Moving forward to 2021, last year's season, um, Morton National Park is recovering well. It's full of pink flannel flowers, which everybody loves, but they actually made my life very difficult uh, because they obscured all the orchids. So very pretty, but also very annoying. Um, I was kind of glad when they finished up and that they didn't come back this year. <laughs> Here's another photo of um, some regrowth in Morton. And there's actually three orchids in this photo that I was able to find. There's the one on the left that I initially took the photo for, and then when I saw this bigger on my computer, I saw there was actually two more on the right. So regrowth is also uh, hampering survey efforts somewhat, but it's, uh, it's still a good thing. So in 2021, we were able to continue population monitoring, including finding uh, almost 100 new plants, which was awesome. Um, we pinned all the new plants, collected demographic data. I also collected some pollination data, and we collected seed, but only at the unburnt sites. So the burnt sites, we weren't able to collect seed. And then in 2022, the season is just finishing up now, so I've only got some preliminary data for you, but again, population monitoring, pinned new plants, demographic data and pollination data, but we didn't collect seed this year. Now, I just want you to put yourself into the mind of an orchid. Just imagine you're a little orchid growing. You start out, you pop up a stem and a leaf, which uh, is here on the right, and if you're going to flower this year, you will start to develop buds and you'll start looking a little bit like a very tiny asparagus plant. Um, and then if all goes well, you will develop some nice big healthy buds. Um, you might even have a spider friend hanging out on you. And then you flower and you're this wonderful magenta colour. You've got this really long fringed labellum which flaps in the breeze. But what is your purpose in life, aside from looking cute and smelling like raspberries? Well, you need to be pollinated. We don't actually know what the pollinator is of Superbum at the moment, but it's probably a chloropted or drosophyllid fly, similar to other Genoplesium species. So this here is a Genoplesium filiforme uh, in Morton National Park, and it has a chloropted fly on it with a pollinia pollen packet on its back. Um, but yeah, we don't know exactly what pollinates Superbum yet. Probably something similar though. And it's... Fortunately, pretty easy to tell if a genoplasium has been pollinated. So if pollination is successful, the flower will close up and it'll point upwards and then the ovary at the base will swell and start to develop seeds. Uh, if they haven't been pollinated, the flowers close and they point downwards and then everything just kind of shrivels up and withers away. Once the seed capsules develop, they will split and the seed is dispersed. And Orchid seed is really tiny, in case anyone's not seen it before. So this is a different Genoplesium species, but those specks of dust on my palm, they are orchid seeds. So the data that we've collected so far, again, preliminary baseline data, uh, number of plants in each population, the number of plants that have flowered, the number of plants within a population that have been pollinated, and then within an individual plant, the number of flowers that were pollinated. So that gives us flowering rate, pollination, a pollination rate of the population, and then individual pollination rate as well. So here are some numbers from 2020 onwards. Um, you can see that each year, the number of individuals found uh, or emerged above ground stays relatively the same, even though we have located about 100 new individuals in 2021 and about 70 new ones this year. So not all plants will emerge or flower each year. So taking this data, here we have 2021, and you can see that between burnt, which is black, and unburnt, which is the green, um, the flowering rate between the populations is pretty similar. Um, in the 60s, 60% 60 of flower, um, plants will flower. And then what is really concerning is the, um, is the pollination rate. So you would expect that an unburnt population 
would give a pretty good indication of uh, what a healthy population pollination rate should look like, so around 40% or so. But you can see that the burnt populations, um, hardly anything got pollinated. And that transfers over into individual flowers as well. So of those handful of plants that got pollinated, a lot of the time it was just one or two flowers on a plant that were pollinated. Hence the individual pollination rate is also really low. Whereas in the unburnt areas, it was a lot of the time the whole plant, uh, every flower was pollinated, um, but on average about half, uh, half of the flowers on a plant were pollinated. And this trend continues into 2022. So similar flowering rates of uh, in the 60% or so, but pollination rate is still really low in burnt areas. And this, we, yeah, when, when they're not pollinated, they, um, they, they'll shrivel up and, and, and just wither away, which is not what we want. So what's going on with the pollinators? Uh, some pollinators probably survived the fires in 2022, maybe in the ground um, as larvae, and then they were able to pollinate some plants in Morton in 2020, hence why we were able to concede. Um, but then the fires probably, well, all the habitat was gone. You saw complete moonscape. So there's no pollinator habitat left, um, which has likely disrupted the breeding and the recruitment as well of pollinators into 2021 and 2022. Uh, obviously we need more investigation. Uh, if there are any students out there who would like a project, I have one for you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this lack of pollination now seems to be a pretty, like it could be a pretty major threat for this species in going forwards. So what's next? Um, next year we are going to survey for new plants, um, check out some more of the rock shelves in Morton, um, where there's suitable habitat. There's also a few more historic sites and historic records that we need to chase up. Uh, obviously collect more pollination data, um, hopefully observe and identify the pollinator. And then, I haven't mentioned herbivory yet, um, but herbivory hasn't really been an issue in Morton National Park, probably because the fires took out everything, including the herbivores. Um, unburnt sites, had quite a high predation rate, uh, predation, herbivory rate. Um, so we put cages on them to try to prevent herbivory. Um, but we next season are going to put out some camera traps to see if we can observe uh, herbivores eating uh, orchids, any that aren't caged, and then um, see if anything's coming back into Morton. So thanks to everyone involved, uh, colleagues at Saving Our Species on the Southeast Eats team, um, Plant Bank, some amazing volunteers, and then the local landholders who have allowed, have allowed us to look for orchids on their properties. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Uh, we now come to question time for this session. So I think those online can post questions in the chat, correct? Yeah, and we'll try and cover a mix, mixture of questions from those in person and those online. No? None yet, no, that's okay, but when they come in. So um, feel free to begin and ask a question to any of the speakers we've had in this session. species collection when you are um, trying to drop that many seeds. I think in the nursery industry there is a propensity to grow things that are easy to grow um, and easy when they can collect seeds, easy to germinate and I wonder how the, um, the your, your seed choice will be influenced by those sort of factors. Yeah, that's a, sorry, can you, can you guys hear us? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I guess the, the onus of the grant is to not work on easy stuff, you know, is to try and take a couple of exemplar um, endangered communities, so we're working in Cumberland Plain woodlands um, in the Sydney area at the moment, and Western Sydney dry rainforest, um, and looking at both of those and taking a representative sample from a trait perspective. So we're looking, actually looking at 
seed mass as a predictor of the potential for species to be able to germinate in the pods because we don't we want to be able to make inferences like more broadly about what kinds of species will be able to work in this technology and which ones just won't. So, for instance, we saw Bursaria spinosa, which, you know, many people will be familiar with, but it's a very, very tiny seed, you know, difficult to get going unless it's got, you know, surface, unless it's surface sown. And you really do see if you, yeah, bury that seed inside one of these pelleted pods, you know, it just won't come up. So trying to, trying to investigate that more broadly and say, well, you know, of the Western Sydney dry rainforest taxa, of all these different seed masses across maybe 30, 30 of those, um, germinating those in, in experimental trials and saying, is it really about seed mass or is it about placement within the pod? Like, should it go on the periphery of the pod or the centre or do you need just more seeds per pod? So we're really at that very, very basic, how do we do this, you know? Is this possible kind of exciting kind of phase? Like, see where it goes, I guess, yeah. Good question, though. It's going to be Acacia Armageddon if we're not careful. <laughs> yeah, I keep saying Acacia Geddon is coming if we just go for things that are easy to germinate. Or Tasmanian blue gum, <laughs> you know. I just end up with ukes and, ukes and acacias. Yeah. Acacia apocalypse. Acacia apocalypse, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yes, there, thanks. Just wait for the microphone, it's just coming. Rachel, um, how are your data sets affected, all right, by what is known and what is not known about elements of the, of the arid zone? For instance, the Great Victoria Desert is the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, I mean, so we're working, if you're talking in terms of like species, distributions and where we know, where we have information, it's still really biased towards roadsides. You know, I could have, I always show this thing in my talks and I thought it'd just be a bit old hat because I've done it lots of times, but this animation of how we've, how over time we've built up the herbarium collections in Australia and you can just see major roads going through. <laughs> you know, each year it's kind of like more and more collected around roads and there's still places where there's 100 by 100 kilometre square grid cells with no collections whatsoever. So recognising that, you know, that yes, using occurrence data um, from verified herbarium specimens to, to, that have been looked at by a taxonomist has its benefits because, you know, you've actually had someone who knows what species it is look at it, but then that there's huge gaps. And so that's why we also ran a suite of models so we have suitable habitat for species as well. And I guess the truth lies somewhere in between those things. We know we haven't collected everywhere but we know we probably, you know, we know also that it's pretty amazing what the information that we do have in the AVH now compared to 200 years ago. We've done a lot of bad things in 200 years, but we've done a lot as well to understand the flora and collect it and preserve it. And so, yeah, it's a good question, but you just have to find the happy medium in between, I think. Erica, I'm curious about what became of the seeds you collected. Are you planning to grow them or gone to a seed bank or...? It's, uh, it's up at Mount Annan at the seed bank. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, Hello. Ha -ha. It's, um, it's up at Mount Annan uh, at the seed bank. Uh, Gavin will know specifically what happened to it because he took it away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, also... Um, Zoe's talking about the seed bank and another orchid project that we're doing with germination with them later, but different species. Um, and I wasn't able to get super bum on the list, unfortunately. Um, but also, just in case anyone asks, um, no, we haven't tried hand pollination. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was on the list and I have asked about it, but the flowers are so small. Um, apparently, it's basically impossible to, to hand pollinate an orchid that small. Um, I do want to try next season. Um, this season was a bit wonky because of all of the rain and the floods. It actually meant that I couldn't get to any of the sites for about a month um, and I missed a lot of the flowering, uh, which was a pain. Um, but I could still get data, which was good. Um, but yeah, so just before anyone asks about hand pollination. <laughs> Can I ask one about the orchids? 
Uh, you have to okay. wait till oh, yeah. Amelia has a question online. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I have a question from um, Zoe Joy Newby in the online audience. I hope her ears are burning. Um, <laughs> it's a question for Richard. Um, did you find, um, did you notice anything about feral pigs and whether they're making the impact of Phytophthora worse, for mm. example, by spreading or by plant damage? Uh, there's certainly plant damage, um, but I'm not sure about Phytophthora. I imagine they would be spread uh, by but often would be spread by um, pigs, um, especially since they occur largely in wet areas and that's where Phytophthora is most um, active. Um, yeah, so the, one of the sites for the Asperula was dug up. Um, you probably didn't see the, I probably had, didn't have the plot up long enough, but the Asperula population, the largest one along Stunselburn River, decreased almost to nothing as a result of pig damage. Um, it, the plant was just surviving where the, veg, the um, shrubs were thick enough so the pigs couldn't get into. So um, we were involved in helping with a, as a massive project, multi-million dollar project happening on KI right now to get rid of pigs. Um, so hopefully that'll work. Um, the aim is to try and rid the whole island of uh, feral pigs. Probably easier than getting them, teaching them how to wash their feet. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the <laughs> exactly. Just take one more, Rachel, if you can ask yours, and that'll be... Oh, yeah, probably. I'm curious about the caging of the, um, of the orchids and whether that differed between the burnt and the unburnt in, and how it um, shapes interactions with pollinators. Have you ever looked at that? Um, well, we only have, what, three years of... Yeah. <laughs> three years of data. Um, but the, the cages, they all have... Some of them are chicken wire, um, and then some of them are aviary wire, so they still have quite yeah. um, large holes, so it's just to exclude uh, herbivores, not mm. um, pollinators. But some of them grow right on a wombat track, mm. and we have them caged, but every time I go out, I have to prop the cage back up again right. and open it out, because this wombat just ploughs right over the top of them. <laughs> um, but the orchids pop back up, and yeah. they haven't been munched, so... Mm. OK, I'm going to call an end to the question session then because we have uh, morning tea coming. Mm -hmm. But before we break, I'd just like to thank our three speakers from this morning for really informative talks on how the country is recovering after the fires. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.